Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Book Passage, Conversations with Authors. We're so glad you're joining us this evening. My name is Cheryl Bronstein. I'm one of the event coordinators here and just really happy to welcome you to our online events. Uh, we have two stores. We've got our store in Corte Madera. We have our store in San Francisco. Both stores are currently open seven days a week. So come on in, browse, buy your books from us in store. You can also order through our website and you can give us a call. We still do answer our phone. So you can call us and we are very happy to help you over the phone with all your book purchases. So thank you to all of our loyal customers out there who are tuning in this evening. And there's probably some new people out there. Maybe you've never been to a book passage event or to a book passage store. If that's the case, I welcome you. Thank you for joining us. We hope that uh, we, this will be the beginning of a long relationship. We want to be your primary source for books. Book Passage has a very busy, active event calendar. We've got a lot of things on the docket for this spring and summer. So take a look at our website. We don't want you to miss any of the very exciting events that we have going on. I'm going to mention a few. We've got uh, an online event with former Attorney General Eric Holder. Mr. Holder will be discussing his new book, Our Unfinished March. And this event will take place June 1st. 6 p.m. Again, it is an online event, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Tickets are still available. We also have a signing, an in-person signing with celebrity chef Andy Bargani, and that's going to take place in our San Francisco store on Saturday, May 28th at 1 p.m. Chef Bargani is releasing his newest cookbook, The Cook You Want to Be. And again, this is a free in-person event. We hope you will join us. So again, keep close tabs on our calendar. We're adding things all the time, a very busy spring and summer schedule. We hope you will continue to enjoy our conversations with authors, both in person and online. Here at Book Passage, our mission is to enrich, engage, and inspire. And Book Passage has been a Bay Area institution and a family-owned business for over 40 years. So again, a big thank you to all the, our loyal customers we hope to be around to serve you for another 40 years. Sometimes the dog you want is not the dog that you get. When Meredith May and her wife, Jen, adopt an adorable golden retriever puppy, they had no idea of the journey they would soon begin. Loving Edie is a story that describes their ups and downs as they bond, discover solutions, fail, and try again and again, until they ultimately find a lifestyle that pleases everyone in the household. Loving Edie captures the bravery in loving another being and why love always is worth it because it teaches us so much. Meredith May spent 16 years at the San Francisco Chronicle where her narrative reporting won the Penn USA Literary Award for Journalism and was shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize. Her 2019 memoir has been published in 17 countries and translated into 11 languages. And she will soon publish a children's picture book titled My Hive, and that's coming in the spring of 2023. She is a co-author of I Who Did Not Die and is a fifth generation beekeeper. She lives in San Francisco where she keeps several hives in her community garden. And we're so happy to have her with us this evening. Now, Meredith is joined today by Julian Guthrie. Julian is the founder and CEO of Alfie, a new technology platform to advance women. She's a veteran journalist and a New York Times bestselling author. She's written five books, including Alpha Girls, the untold story of pioneering women in Silicon Valley, which is now being adapted into a television series. So we are all anxiously awaiting to view that. She too has a nutty high energy golden retriever and looks forward to learning from Edie and Meredith. So let's please give a warm welcome to our virtual book passage stage. We welcome Meredith May and Julian Guthrie. You guys are on. Yep. 
Thank you for having me, Cheryl. Thank you so much. I am just very excited to be here and um, talk with my good friend, Julian, about riding puppies and all that goes in between. Well, I am really happy you asked me to do this. And I love this book. Um, I mean, how adorable is that, right? But you thought you got adorable, which I also thought I got. But the story of Edie is over the top. Um, I had no idea what you were going through. And this, so you got Edie shortly after the Honey Bus came out. So you were yes. promoting and dealing with this puppy who was full of surprises. Um, I love the book. It's so powerful. I had tears in my eyes at the end. I marveled at a lot of things um, that I learned about your journey, um, about the journey into um, what to do with a, um, a, a, a very afraid dog. And, you know, where does that fear come from? Is it inherited? Um, I love so many elements of this story and so many surprise twists and turns. Um, but a really, really beautiful and powerful story on the human side and on the dog side and how when we get into relationships, we think it's going to be one way and we have to be totally open to it being another way. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, so I'm a mom and I have had this experience that you described when you first brought Edie to, um, to a play group. And it was like the first play date and you felt, and she, she was not integrating, she was not acclimating. And you felt, I think the word was shame. Um, and that's something that, you know, if like your child isn't succeeding and it's not something we want to admit, but it's there, you know, you were like, oh, that's my kid, right? Or that's my dog. Talk about that a little bit mm -hmm. about, and give the background of, of Edie and you'd had Stella, the wonder dog before. Right. Well, first, I really uh, appreciate, I really like that um, you're saying you, you feel a motherhood type theme through, through that, because when I was writing it, I was very, um, con you know, concerned and anxious that I would be comparing having a, a puppy with special needs to having a child with special needs, you know, and of something I know nothing about, I don't have children, but that's the one thing that keeps coming back a lot to me is that people who are parents of humans are seeing a lot of the same threads in there. And yeah, so the honey bus came out in 2019 and I guess my wife and I, well, I should say me, I decided to throw a puppy bomb in the middle of uh, my first book tour and it was a, a zany time, but I really wanted a puppy because it'd been uh, almost two years since um, my previous golden retriever, Stella, the perfect dog uh, passed away. And as the months went by, I was just feeling more and more wrong without a puppy by my side. And it took some convincing of my wife because she had never had a puppy. And in fact, she had um, uh, PTSD actually from her childhood, she would bring home strays and she had a stepfather who was rather cruel and he would disappear the kitties or the puppy when he got tired of them. And uh, so she, she shut down that part of her having a puppy. So it took some convincing definitely, but a lot of the convincing was based on what I knew about my two previous Goldens, which were central casting. They were these, every dog food commercial you've seen, these happy, bouncy, goofy Goldens. And you know, Julian, cause you have a Golden. They're just these love bugs. And I wanted to fix that part of my wife's history. And so I kept telling her, this is gonna be great. This is going to be so much fun. We're gonna be laughing all the time going to bring us closer together. And we bring Edie to her first puppy play date at the SPCA. And it's a complete disaster. All the puppies run together in a big scrum 
and ours goes running for the door and is having an absolute meltdown. And so it was kind of like everything I promised my wife just unraveled in front of me. And she's looking at me like, what is going on with this puppy? And I, yeah, I felt shame, embarrassment, disappointment, frustration, confusion. It was the weirdest thing. I've never seen a puppy run in terror from other puppies. And I would say, especially this breed, but I don't know if that's the case, but with this breed, you expect gregariousness and they're fearless and they're ultimately goofy and just bundles of, of, of love. So is it a, is there, is that a breed stereotype or is there, are there certain dogs that are more prone to this sort of fear? Um, I think it could probably be in any breed. I mean, a lot of the reading I did led me to understand that, you know, it could, it could be something that happened to the uh, mother dog when she was pregnant. Um, so I don't think that there's a, a more fearful dog than others, but I do think with the golden retriever breed, they're supposed to be mellow. Like they can take anything. I mean, I remember with Stella, uh, little kids would ask to pet her. And I remember this one time, this kid act like accidentally, well, not accidentally, he poked at Stella's eyeball and like pushed it back. And my dog just sat there like, wow, that was weird. I mean, super calm. And I think that's the appeal of the golden retriever. They're just, they're, um, they're called the family dog because they're so good with little kids. Like they're unflappable. Well, uh, you know, and then, and then from that play date, it, it got more difficult and it got harrowing and it got uh, life endangering mm -hmm. and it got really bad. And I, you know, it, it kind of tested your relationship. It tested your sense of, you know, what a dog is, is for, are you there for the dog? Is the dog there for you? You have a perception of, I'm going to go on hikes with the dog. I'm going to go do all these things with the dog. So um, it, you know, there were a couple of scenes in the book where <clears throat> she gets off leash and it was, you really, I mean, you're a beautiful writer and um, uh, with such detail, you feel you are right there and you are chasing the dog and mm -hmm. anyone who's lost again, making these parallels between child or dog, you know, offspring that you love um, or, or just some, someone in your life that you love dearly. And if it's, if it's a child or if it's a puppy or whatever it is, if you turn around and that, let's say a child or a dog is, is not there, there's nothing. It's just the worst feeling. It's the sickening feeling in your gut. And in your case, you just had to react right away because she was on a tear. So, I mean, I thought that they were both really harrowing um, and very real. I don't know if you want to tell either one of those stories. I, they were so, so vivid. Yeah, I'd be happy to, because that's when I realized, okay, not, you know, at first we thought it was puppy fear and maybe just an extra big case of puppy fear and that we could just work with her and, and get her out of it. But when we realized that, oh no, this is actually something super severe was, uh, yeah, I'll tell the story. Um, we were, we had taken Edie with us down to um, Big Sur to do an event for the Honey Bus because we were in the middle of the book tour. And I thought I had carefully planned everything. I invited two other friends with their dogs to um, be with Edie while I was talking outside in the forest and, and make sure she was well taken care of. And um, then my wife and I were driving home to San Francisco and we decided to pull over in Carmel and have lunch because Edie had done so well over the past two days and um, eat at an outdoor cafe and have Edie be under the table. And this again was it early on um, when I hadn't quite realized that Edie's needs have to come before mine. And so I was still hoping to get Edie to be the dog that Stella was, and Stella was a great travel dog. So we went to a restaurant and we put Edie underneath. I tied her to my chair. We gave her a bowl of water and she was doing great. She fell asleep. And then my, um, the chef who's a friend of mine came over and startled her and she bolted and I stood up to hug him. So then she, she could get free and the chair was chasing her 
So then she's that spooking her and then she runs straight into traffic and she's running uphill against two lanes of oncoming traffic and cars are screeching out of the way. And we're both running in the middle of traffic and I'm thinking, my God, I'm going to watch this puppy get killed and it's my fault. It's my stubbornness and not changing what I want to do. And, uh, you know, this is in the middle of the book, so uh, I'm not giving it away when we say that we eventually found her eight blocks away, but it that was when we had a real serious talk about what are, what do we have on our hands and can we handle this? Because, oh, wow. like, yeah, like what if someone had crashed? What if someone had gotten hurt? I mean, it was my fault that I didn't have her tied down tight enough, but even more so it's my fault that I kept bringing her into situations she couldn't handle because I wanted it. Well, and it was a crossroads uh, because, I mean, not that road, but where you <laughs> were, because it, then Jen, I think said, you know, there's one thing and she's a police officer. So she's thinking about safety. She's thinking about your safety. She's thinking about ED safety. She's thinking about public safety. And she says, you know, it's now the dynamics have changed. You know, it was Edie was endangering herself. Now she's endangering us or we are complicit some level of that. But it was really a, um, a pivotal scene of like, holy cow, we we did not know we are not we did not know what we were getting into here. And where do we go from here? So I really, you know, again, there's a lot of. There's a lot of momentum in the book. It's very, very um, vivid, vividly uh, written um, and reconstructed. Um, and you just feel like you're right there. V very good job, Meredith. Very, very powerful writing. But it was, I mean, it's, it struck me as this very emotional turning point. And I think we can all relate. Like if you have, if you have a, a special needs dog and I have had one, um, it's, it's not easy. And there are times when you're like, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I have the bandwidth. And so what was that like in that, in that moment when she posed that question after this, you know, really scary event? She's yeah. She's always been the more um, responsible one in the relationship. I mean, we we're a good yin and yang. Like I, um, uh, she makes me um, more responsible, but I make her loosen up a little bit, but when it comes to having to make these hard decisions and have serious talks, she's the one who will say, and in this case, what she said was, you know, maybe this dog is too um, fearful for the world. You know, she said, you know, what if um, she had caused an accident? What if someone had gotten hurt or died? You know, what if, um, you know, she injures one of us, she's only going to get bigger because when she, has a panic attack, what she does is she freezes and then she bolts her fight or flight, um, takes over her brain and she bolts like a spooked horse, you know, without thought of where she's going. And, um, you know, we, we had a serious talk about how much of a liability is this poor creature, not only for ourselves, but strangers. And so, I didn't, I didn't want to give up on Edie, you know, and, and we, we talked about all the options, you know, do we um, know anybody with a farm? Um, do we have any friends who could take her? But then Jen pointed out, that's just sort of passing the problem. That's also irresponsible, you know, uh, bringing her to a shelter is horrible. I mean, she, I knew she, I mean, could have a, a severe panic attack about being in a shelter. I didn't want to do that. And then I worried about who would take her and have to start over from zero, figuring out that she's a very different dog and that would set her back. So I think in having that discussion and then having a sleep on it, um, we decided to keep trying. Well, and then you go on this journey, which takes you into, um, you know, doggy psychic land um, I think I did that for one dog once. So I was kind of trying to remember that I had a pug long ago and, um, 
named Oliver and we did, we did that. And I was dubious, very, very skeptical as you were, but it took you on this journey of discovery. And, you know, I think your reporting skills uh, really served you well in finding experts in the field, um, doing a lot of research, looking at all possible angles. Um, but just, you know, I, so finding the experts, and there were a couple of really key people um, who, who uh, made all the difference in your lives and your family life. What were the, what were the highlights there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, like you said, the journalist in me came out, I guess this is phase two where, okay, now I'm committed. Now I'm going to find out why, what's wrong with, and I'm going to find out how to fix it. So I'm going to read every book that's out there about dogs with fear. I'm going to consult with um, experts and behaviorists and veterinarians and psychics. I'll ask anybody what to do. I will try every product out there. <laughs> Um, so, and I, I, I still, I, in this phase was not accepting Edie. I was still working on her and trying to get her to be the dog. I felt I'd been cheated out of. Right. Incredible so, well, there she's back. Oh, okay. Am I back? So, um, am, okay. So this was phase. Am I back now? Yes. Okay. So this was phase two where I was researching everything just to try to get Edie back to the dog I felt I'd been somehow cheated out of, right? So yeah, the journalist in me came out and I was going to interview and research everything. And I took a super big deep dive into um, the dog's, the neurobiology of dog fear, which was super interesting because I found out it's very similar to human fear and our brains are actually shaped very similarly. and. Um, but act, but the experts that really helped the most, I had a, um, a Edie's puppy trainer, her puppy class teacher was wonderful. And also a veterinarian, um, that explained to me that with dogs like this, you have to, um, introduce them to new things in short, short little steps. Hi, am I still on? Okay. Sure. Okay. Oh, um, hello audience. Very nice to see you. <laughs> oh, I can't see you. you. Mm -hmm. Apologies. Everybody, we, I was not set up to appear on camera. There we go. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, Apollo, uh, uh, sorry that uh, we, we dropped out here. Oh, Cheryl, you're here. Hello. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like just Julian um, dropped out, but uh, I can just continue what she was yeah. asking yeah, me about. Yeah, because uh, you were you were getting to a really interesting point about what your um, trainer had had told you. You know, some of the things you need to do. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so the um, the trainer explained to us that you know Edie needs needs we need to stop and just have a timeout and stay in the house with her and then slowly pick one place to introduce her to and bring her there just for a few minutes at a time until she, and if she freaks out you bring her back so she has to make all the moves which you know in my mind I was thinking well you know, then you're having the dog control you, right? That's not how you train a dog. And so I had to really unlearn everything and learn to watch her body language. And the trainer taught me about um, looking at Edie and when she drools or when she yawns, when her tail is down, you know, all these signs are her ramping up to having a panic attack. And these are, some of them are obvious, but like the yawning, I didn't realize that that's a sign of dog stress. Mm -hmm. Um, so she worked with me on that. She, um, showed me, uh, a, a, an app for dogs who are sensitive to noise and they have, it's a, it's called puppy school. 
and so that you can pick the noise on there that your pet doesn't like and play it at really low soft volume and give her treats at the same time Hello. she gets used to it hi julian i can hear hi. you so i was just talking about um your question and the what the trainer suggested i do and the the puppy sound desensitization app and then um and then I found a really good vet. Yeah, so um, uh, my internet kicked me out and now it's not letting me come in with a camera, but I'm gonna try to get back, but I'm here via audio. So we'll continue the, the mysteries of, of Zoom, uh, which we've all been living with for far too long. But, um, you know, and then, and, and I don't know what I missed, but your, um, your journey then to um, to having a better sense of what the direction was, was also really fascinating um, to follow. Like, again, you're going through all this research and, and you're starting to see little glimmers of hope, right? With Edie. Exactly. Like uh, she, she would still get, she would still get um, nervous in, in situations, but she would turn and run back to me. I and mean, we didn't take her off the leash anymore, but she would rather than try to pull me and run away with me, she would turn and run to me. And that is all that I needed just to teach her that I'm home base, you know? So it was a lot of counter conditioning and a lot of um, just watching her and listening to her body language and, you know, really altering what it meant in my mind to own a puppy. Well, you, you write, um, Jen and I got through childhood by confronting fear, not succumbing to it. And, you know, I, I think there are just so many profound um, lessons here about just identifying fear and dealing with fear. And, um, you know, it was also such a personal story of you, your childhood, which I read, obviously, through the beautiful book, The Honey Bus. But I learned even more. And then Jen's childhood, and she had all sorts of reasons to be fearful um, as well and figure out ways to confront fear. So on the topic of fear, how, how did, how did, you know, how did you come to, um, to look at, at what it is differently through Edie? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. You know, both both Jen and I, um, in a sense, had to raise ourselves. And so, you know, when you come from um, childhoods that are challenging, um, you learn how to kind of fake it till you make it. I mean, you don't um, necessarily have the same um, foundations under your feet, you know, the same mentors in your life to fall back on. So, you know, a lot of it is um, survival bluffing. And <clears throat> so uh, I've always looked at fear as a weakness and uh, something that gets in my way. Uh, so I, you know, Edie showed me, Edie was really frustrating for me um, in the beginning, but she slowly in her way showed me what it means to be um, selfless and a comfort for someone else. And, you know, dare I say, uh, maternal, which is something that I didn't think I had the capability to do because, um, you know, I was raised in my grandparents' home. Hi, there you are. Back. I persevered. Uh, with a depressed mother, you know, who would openly rue the day she got married and had children and, um, you know, kind of indirectly taught me that to give birth is to support tracked from yourself mm -hmm. so you know um so that sort of sent me on a life journey of of um just working really hard um not giving into fear and and things that slow me down really frustrated me so i you know, they say that dogs come along in your life when you need to learn a lesson that you don't know you need to learn. And I now looking back on it, um, I can see that the point of Edie was to 
teach me that, um, you know, it's okay to slow down and that different doesn't mean, um, you know, defective. It just means different. And, um, that I can mother something and there's Im immense joy in that rather than being first and fast and perfect. I'd rather be messy and imperfect and, um, and, you know, full of love for what she can do. You know, this book, um, obviously it's for anyone who has um, a special needs dog, who has a special dog. And we all think our um, dogs or pets or loved ones are very special. Um, but it's also about, you know, a lesson that I, that really resonated with me is that we have expectations for other people that we love and we want them to be this way and to act this way and to do this. And sometimes uh, we need to just step back and really accept who they are. And so I got that from this book. Um, and I didn't necessarily expect to get that. I didn't know what I expected with the story. I'd heard some about it, but there are so many applicable lessons, um, whether between animal human bond or human to human, you know, mm -hmm. that acceptance that you were talking, don't expect, you know, because you were putting all of these Stella like expectations on Edie. Oh, for sure. I mean, when I first told my agent, I, I want to write about uh, my dog all I had to do was say, you know, puppy. And she said, yes, like she didn't hear the rest of the pitch, right? Um, because we love stories about cute puppies. But I think it, even I, in the beginning, thought I was writing about this difficult dog. And no, I mean, ultimately I'm writing about how I'm evolving because of this beautiful dog, right? And yeah, I think, there's so, I mean, the, the canon of dog books is huge. I didn't realize how huge it was until I started trying to read a lot of them. But I think uh, there are a lot of books about people who get dogs to help them, the human, with their mental issues. And then the, the books about Dogs who have emotional issues are more um, how to's, more training, more advicey. So I, I think I slipped into a little like slice of in between the two, where mine is about how I'm trying to help her with her emotional issues, but the back end of it is that it ends up helping me too. So I, I wasn't really sure what the book was about when I was writing it because it was all happening as I was writing it. And then, um, which it, is it, very it, brave it, unto itself. <laughs> <laughs> like when you don't have the full outline, you don't have it all figured out. Um, I'm interested in the writing process that you had here. Um, when, when did you decide this was the book? When you're talking about, you talk to your agents about a puppy, but when did you decide, decide you wanted to write this? We know that writing books is very, very arduous. It's exhausting. It's like having a baby. You feel like I'm never going to do this again. And then you get yeah. a little bit of a distance away and you're like, oh, I could do it again. Uh, but when did you decide that? Yeah. Well, because we got Edie in the middle of the Honey Bus promotion, um, you know, Park Row Books and Harper Collins were having a field day with my pictures, my cute puppy pictures. And then they, they were putting out things like, this puppy loves the honey bus. And, you know, she was like a little, little poster promotional thing for the honey bus. And so they all knew her. And, and when we would exchange emails uh, with my agent or my publishers, they would say, oh, how's Edie? And I felt like I was kind of hiding from them once I started realizing that, um, she has um, severe anxiety, I wouldn't bring it up. And then I thought, you know what? I have to like tell them, I have to confess. And I think I have to write about this because it was consuming my relationship. You know, I was the stay-at-home writer and Jen uh, was the nine to fiver at the police station. She was a Lieutenant. And so she would come home after I'd spent a day just stuck in the house with this like 
bouncing puppy that's afraid to go outside and my ankles were all chewed up and I was really going crazy. And we were having this like very traditional argument about, you don't know what I go through all day. And um, so to answer your question, I think when it became such a thing that it's all I could talk about, then I realized, okay, obsession time, book time. And then, you know, as I said, I, you know, you and I, obviously we worked together so many, many years at the San Francisco Chronicle, but um, I knew your story and then I'm a huge fan of the Honey Bus. And this story, I learned more about you. And there, there are times when you reference your grandfather, like when you didn't know what to do with Edie and you prayed to him. But I was also really moved by Jen's story. And, you know, I've met her a few times, but haven't had a chance to get to know her. And that's, that unto itself is a powerful story. So, you know, you're writing a memoir, you're adding to your own memoir in a way, you're writing Edie's, but you're also writing elements of Jen's. And so what, what was that like? And how did you, how did you make her comfortable that that was something that was a part of this book, which it had to be? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's funny because, you know, as, um, you know, our personalities are so very different. She's very private and very close to the vest. She's a police officer, you know, and, and I'm a, a memoirist who wants to tell you everything. So um, it's a really interesting sort of yin yang relationship. Um, she makes me more responsible. And I think I make her loosen up a bit, but yeah, this is the classic memoir question, right? Because people don't in your, my life don't ask to be in my memoirs. Um, what my personal rule is I show everybody what I've written uh, so they can see it. I don't show them so they can change it. Um, I show it in case there's anything like completely factually wrong or, um, and also so they won't be surprised when it comes out. Um, and, but Jen, the, you know, we did go through, she's like, oh, do you have to write about that? Do you, you know, and um, I would just let it sit you know, and then I would say, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to use this or that, but um, I do need, you know, honey, I do need to explain why you didn't want a puppy. And so, and I would give her pages and, and slowly she'd come around like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. And she is really, really supportive of what I do. And, um, you know, I love her for that. I love that she gets it, even though it makes her a little squeamy, she gets it. Well, and I had no idea how much um, Edie influenced your move um, out of San Francisco. So that was also like, wow, this dog really, this beautiful creature, um, you know, with, with her own set of problems really shaped your life in so many unanticipated ways. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a cautionary tale or if that's a really um, encouraging one because you ended up in a great place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if I got Edie in my 20s, I, I would not be able yeah. to make the changes that we made to try to accommodate our family. And, you know, we, um, we, we got her when, um, we were both also considering moving out of San Francisco. You know, we, we both moved there in our twenties, which is the perfect place to be. You know, it's so exciting and vibrant and that's why you move there in your twenties because it's nonstop fun. And what a great city to report on. I mean, you and I were both there for like 15 something years. It's, it's never ending uh, roller coaster, right? But, you know, we were approaching 50 and we were getting um, to be cranky. You know, we want to go to bed at nine and we want a parking space and we don't want to spend $10 for a latte anymore. <laughs> like, we're just, so um, I, we had always wanted to move back to my hometown in Carmel Valley, but um, the way the napkin math worked out for Jen, she, when we got 80, she still needed to work for two, two or three more years before retiring. So, um, but because we were living in a city where our dog refused to walk on the street 
it was like, it forced us to start looking sooner, kind of casually, but of course we found something we wanted in a couple of weeks. So we made the decision to live apart um, during the week. And then on weekends, Jen would come home. So we did that for about a year. And then she retired early because of COVID. You know, it just seemed kind of silly to be going from Carmel Valley to San Francisco before there were vaccines. So, um, so Edie forced the issue, but, you know, I, I, I didn't buy a house for my dog. I'm not that <laughs> much of a, um, you know, I, I can't afford that, but she made us make a change that we, that was fine. You know, even though we thought it wouldn't be financially affordable, it, we made it work and we probably wouldn't have done it if she hadn't forced the issue. Um, I'd love to get, I, I wanna read a passage um, in, in toward the end and it's about when there's the fire. Um, but it, what advice would you give, you know, to people who have um, a, a pet uh, an animal in, in their lives um, who that is really troubled and that isn't your standard um, your, or doesn't meet your expectations or has special needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, start with, you know, if, if they've got a list of fears, pick one and work on it with them. With, you know, I learned a lot from the behaviorist about counter conditioning where you, when they, you have, they have to encounter what scares them. They have to encounter it in, in a controlled situation in very low doses. So for example, if your dog is afraid of um, motorcycles, um, now let's, let me do another one, traffic. If your dog is afraid of traffic, um, and I did this with Edie, each time a car approached, sit her down and I stand on either side of her. So she's between my legs, feel safe. And I give her tons of cookies until the car goes by. And I'd have to do that every time a car comes by. So she switches in her mind, oh, car, I get treats, right? It's, it's a good thing. And so now she hears a car, she sits, she looks at me and she's like, feed me. And she's fine. Cars can go by. But when she was a little puppy, if a car went by and if I didn't have her on a leash, she'd be gone. So you can use counter conditioning to any kind of thing. Like if they're afraid of strangers or people in hats or babies, like whatever it is they're afraid of, you, you set up a controlled environment and, and teach them to get what they want when the scary thing comes by. Well, and then there were sprays, there was Prozac, there was, I don't know if there was aromatherapy, if there was hypnotherapy, but there were, you tried a lot of things. Um, what, what was the cocktail or the mix that actually worked, that helped? Okay, yeah. Um, Prozac, she's on daily Prozac and that seems to work. Mm -hmm. uh, she also likes music. And they make music for anxious dogs. And I have a whole Edie chill out playlist on my phone. So I play music for her. Um, Dog and she TV. Also, yeah, I was just going to say that. It was so cute. I love that where you wrote about yeah. that. Dog TV, which is a streaming channel for dogs. It's shot um, from a dog's point of view. So at their eye level and the colors are saturated for how they see. And it's just streaming video. It's a subscription service of dogs either um, playing or running or swimming or sleeping or, you know, and so your dog um, can watch and like learn new activities that they're afraid of by seeing other dogs do it, or they can calm down. And some people use it when they need to leave their dog home alone, it's entertainment. But I would always use the uh, relaxation calm one with her, but she actually, she's the only dog I've had that actually watches TV. So <laughs> she likes it. I love that. And then there were her buddies, like that it charmed me so much. And there, there are even, I love at the back of the book, there are these illustrations, um, if you all can see that, of her buddies. <laughs> and the special one, was it, uh, was it Chase? Was it, no, yeah. Chase. Her, boyfriend. Uh, her boyfriend, yeah. yeah. And um, just, 
just kind of the role that um, other doggies can play in, in giving courage or showing, I guess, what's possible. How would you summarize that? Yeah, the one, well, I shouldn't say the one, but among the, um, there's, there's things that she's not afraid of. And one is uh, other dogs. She loves to play, even though she didn't like that puppy class, she got over it. But um, yo, yeah, the street we moved on, almost everyone's got a pickup truck in the front yard and a dog behind the fence or dogs everywhere. So one by one, we, we introduced her to each dog, but um, there's a golden retriever. There was a year older than her named Chase and the love affair was instant. And he's, he's the Stella. He's the central casting dog. Nothing bothers him. And so she follows him around and watches what he does. And it's, it's really um, beautiful to see them play together. So Chase's parents take him to all sorts of agility things and scent work classes. And so he's got a little jump that they jump him over like a, like a little PVC bar. So she was, Edie was able to watch Chase do it. And then Edie can jump over that now too. And just little things like that can give an anxious dog tons of confidence. Well, and give you more confidence. And there was a line that was quite powerful as well, where, and I'm paraphrasing, but it was, um, you know, I didn't, we didn't think we could be good moms. That was kind of it. And you ended up being uh, superlative um, friends, parents, whatever you want to call it, and moms. Uh, but maybe that was part of the awakening too. I think so. I, I think so. It was, I don't know if there's any other way I would have learned to have this maternal feeling. And, and, you know, with a dog like this, the, even the tiny little things she does that are so ordinary when she does it, like when she learned to swim in a lake, it was such a huge deal. You know, easy dogs are easy to love, but it's, it's these difficult dogs that, um, you know, their lows are really, really low, but when they have a, a win, it's so much higher. It's so intense, right? It's so, so rewarding that a dog like this can be happy and I can make her happy. Um, and, and that brings me so much more joy than having the perfect dog that entertains me and makes my life fun. You know, it, I would, I would not, I'm happier because I have a special dog. There's so many um, surprising that we haven't touched on uh, plots and, and turning points. And one thing that um, I thought was really, really beautiful um, was the fire that swept through. And, and, and I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just read, I circled one paragraph. Um, in our darkest hour, when the flames were threatening to take everything from us, when the world was on lockdown with no end in sight, Edie put everything on pause and reminded us that the most precious things can burn. I get kind of emotional <laughs> reading it again. Oh, maybe yeah. you want to set the stage a little bit because there's so many, and especially toward the end of the book, there are all these revelations and and I was teary-eyed multiple times um, at, throughout, th you know, the the last part of the book. But that one, it really, it's true. It just sends it home. Yeah. While I was writing this book, we had a, a major wildfire, uh, the Carmel Fire, and it swept through my street and burned down half the homes. So seventeen homes burned. Four. Um, within sight of ours and the fire came into our yard and took out um, part of our yard and um, stopped within a foot of my beehives, which is miraculous. I don't know why our house didn't burn it. It really should have. And um, so it, it was a wild year. And I, um, Jen was at Costco when the fire came and I had 10 minutes and I just grabbed Edie and our geriatric cat and a computer and the police scanner and my car keys. And we were evacuated for three weeks. And so, um, you know, that definitely ended up making it into the book because um, it was in the middle of all that. We were staying with uh, a friend who lived near a lake 
And then Edie, like I was saying, when she has a win, it's so huge. She, at that moment, she chose to show us. We've been trying to teach her for months and months. She's like, oh yeah, I got this, I can swim. And I'm like, there's something my dog can do to exercise, you know, that's safe. And it's, it's another layer I've got with her. And it was, it was, she just picked the perfect moment. Cause for that m minute, we just forgot about worrying about whether or not we had a house anymore. It's just like, we could just be right. It was a very like Zen Buddhist moment. Um, is she, will she ever be unafraid or it's always, it's always anticipating her fears and her living with fear or can she grow out of, you know, will she eventually become unafraid? Um, it depends on the thing. Um, there are things that she will never be okay with. And, um, like it, she, she just doesn't like, um, novelty in her surroundings and especially if they're busy places. So like, I could never take her out of the car in a parking lot of any kind. I could never walk her on a sidewalk in a busy place. Um, but she can hike on a secluded trail for hours. So it's just, um, it's a matter of finding out what she can and can't do and then rearranging my schedule around that. Um, and then she's overcome some fears. Like uh, she couldn't use the dog door for, for the longest time. And now she'll go, through, it's the kind with saloon doors that go like this and she just didn't like it. And uh, she can do that now. Um, She's not afraid of traffic anymore. And she's not afraid of construction noise because there's been so much in our neighborhood of all the people who are rebuilding. So she doesn't run from nail guns or generators or chainsaws anymore. So she's in, in some ways she's learning to overcome what the fear she had as a puppy, but in general, just putting on her leash and putting her in a new environment that's busy, that'll never work. So, um, yeah, I've had some bookstores say, oh, bring Edie. I'm like, no way, <laughs> that will not work. I'll bring a picture of Edie, mm -hmm. but no, she wouldn't. Well, I wonder, uh, so as you know, I had a special, I had a deaf dog and um, he had been deaf uh, from birth. And so he found very clever ways of um, compensating. And they say that like the other senses are strengthened or accentuated somehow. Um, and he was very, very, very adept at navigating the world. And, and uh, but I wonder, did, did Edie, does Edie have any, for her, she has her differences, she has her um, uniqueness, she has her fears, which, you know, she has some weaknesses. What are her superpowers or her, her strength that she has? Yeah, she is very communicative. Like she, oh. she has a definite routine and she likes to eat at a certain time. She likes to watch TV at a certain time, you know, and she, she's the most communicative dog I've had. And she will actually like lead me to the, the pantry and point to which bin is the dog food bin at almost the same time every day. So I, it, I have a, a connection, a communication with her that's so much deeper than my other dogs because I think she's had to um, try to, because she's so fearful, she's had to tell me what she's afraid of and, and how to help her out of it. So I can see when she's trying to tell me something, whether it's not, I'm afraid of this, my ball stuck over here and I'm afraid to put my head next to it to get it, or it's dinner time. Like we have a, a really intense um, communication system that's a little spooky sometimes. So I think that that's kind of cool. That is. Um, the last thing that I wanted to ask you, which you've touched on, but I'd love to hear your just whatever comes to mind. Um, I think this was Jen who said, um, the dog chose us for a reason in quick, you know, what is that reason? Um, well, she brought me and Jen closer together as a family, which is what I wanted to do from the beginning, but I wanted it 
to happen because it was easy and fun, but because it was hard and difficult, it, I got the same result and, and for a um, deeper reason. Well, congratulations on this beautiful book. And it is obviously darling, um, great gift for any, um, any dog lover in your life. And um, it's not an easy thing writing a book. Congratulations. I love this. You have another book coming out, which I didn't know about. Oh, I, a little bit about the children's book. I knew a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah, I, um, I was contacted by um, a children's publisher, um, Cameron Kids, and they asked if I could turn the honey bus into a picture book for little kids. And so I gave it a shot and yeah, um, it's gonna come out. It's now been pushed to 2024 of spring, but I've seen some of the early drawings and it's just really cool to see yourself drawn um, with my grandpa and we making oh. honey. I'm so excited about it. So I'm, it's inspired me. I want to try to do another children's book about Edie. So I'm now writing children's books. Go figure. Go figure. Um, I was thinking this could make for a great, um, a great TV show, um, a great, you know, streaming Netflix or whatever. Um, so I hope you get, I hope you get an offer. Have the offers yeah. come in yet? That would be great. No, yeah. not yet, but um, I can see it. I can, I can definitely see it. See it. You know, it's, it's very filmic. It's, um, you know, the details of the writing are really beautiful. But, um, but again, it just pulled at my heartstrings. It made me emotional. It opened my eyes to kind of special needs um, uh, animals, even more so than I had been. And um, just made me love, you know, my doggy as, as he is. Uh, more Mac. other than thinking you got to be this way why aren't you trained I put all this money into the trainer and it's a disaster why do you eat rocks and right. <laughs> all these things that you know dogs do to irritate us and why can't you be like this look at this perfect doggy over here who minds so well um, I mean there are those goals but to love your dog and or your person or whatever it is um, and accept have 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 acceptance I got that out of this yeah yeah Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I needed to learn how to um, stop being neurotic about my neurotic dog. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> well, thank you, Julian. This is, it's so nice to see you again and to talk shop with you. So and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm um, sorry for the little uh, tech snafu. I'm traveling and um, but it worked out. We found our way back to one another. Yes, for sure. Julian and Meredith, thank you so much for spending the hour with our Book Passage community and family today. Here's the book, Loving Edie. It would make a wonderful gift. It is such a miraculous journey that Meredith May writes about. Um, it, it really is a book that can, you know, really make a difference in people's lives. So I urge you to go get it. We have signed book plates that we can put in all the books so you can have a signed copy. We also have copies of the Honey Bus. So again, here's the book. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Meredith and Julian. It's been a great hour. And Book Passage customers and everyone out there listening, thank you for supporting Book Passage and we'll see you in the store. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.